Preface of Principia Ethica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frederick Carlson. Principia Ethica by G. E. Moore. Preface. It appears to me that in ethics, as in all other philosophical studies, the difficulties and disagreements of which its history is full are mainly due to a very simple cause, namely to the attempt to answer questions without first discovering precisely what question it is which you desire to answer. I do not know how far this source of error would be done away if philosophers would try to discover what question they were asking before they set about to answer it, for the work of analysis and distinction is often very difficult. We may often fail to make the necessary discovery, even though we make a definite attempt to do so. But I am inclined to think that in many cases a resolute attempt would be sufficient to ensure success, so that, if only this attempt were made, many of the most glaring difficulties and disagreements in philosophy would disappear. At all events, philosophers seem, in general, not to make the attempt and whether in consequence of this omission or not, they are constantly endeavouring to prove that yes or no will answer questions to which neither answer is correct, owing to the fact that what they have before their minds is not one question, but several, to some of which the true answer is no, to others yes. I have tried in this book to distinguish clearly two kinds of question which moral philosophers have always professed to answer, but which, as I have tried to shew, they have almost always confused both with one another and with other questions. These two questions may be expressed, the first in the form, what kind of things ought to exist for their own sakes, the second in the form, what kind of actions ought we to perform. I have tried to show exactly what it is that we ask about a thing when we ask whether it ought to exist for its own sake, is good in itself, or has intrinsic value, and exactly what it is that we ask about an action when we ask whether we ought to do it, whether it is a right action or duty. But from a clear insight into the nature of these two questions, there appears to me to follow a second most important result, namely what is the nature of the evidence by which alone any ethical proposition can be proved or disproved, confirmed or rendered doubtful. Once we recognize the exact meaning of the two questions, I think it also becomes plain exactly what kind of reasons are relevant as arguments for or against any particular answer to them. It becomes plain that, for answers to the first question, no relevant evidence whatever can be adduced. From no other truth except themselves alone can it be inferred that they are either true or false. We can guard against error only by taking care that, when we try to answer a question of this kind, we have before our minds that question only, and not some other or others. But that there is a great danger of such errors of confusion I have tried to shew, and also what are the chief precautions by the use of which we may guard against them. As for the second question, it becomes equally plain that any answer to it is capable of proof or disproof, that, indeed, so many different considerations are relevant to its truth or falsehood as to make the attainment of probability very difficult, and the attainment of certainty impossible. Nevertheless, the kind of evidence, which is both necessary and alone relevant to such proof and disproof, is capable of exact definition. Such evidence must contain propositions of two kinds and of two kinds only. It must consist, in the first place, of truth with regard to the results of the action in question, of causal truths. But it must also contain ethical truths of our first or self-evident class. Many truths of both kinds are necessary to the proof that any action ought to be done, and any other kind of evidence is wholly irrelevant. It follows that, if any ethical philosopher offers for propositions of the first kind any evidence whatever, or if, for propositions of the second kind, he either fails to adduce both causal and ethical truths, or adduces truths that are neither, his reasoning has not the least tendency to establish his conclusions. But not only are his conclusions totally devoid of weight, we have, moreover, reason to suspect him of the error of confusion since the offering of irrelevant evidence generally indicates that the philosopher who offers it has had before his mind not the question which he professes to answer, but some other entirely different one. Ethical discussion hitherto has perhaps consisted chiefly in reasoning of this totally irrelevant kind. 
one main object of this book may then be expressed by slightly changing one of kant's famous titles i have endeavoured to write prolegomena to any future ethics that can possibly pretend to be scientific in other words i have endeavoured to discover what are the fundamental principles of ethical reasoning and the establishment of these principles rather than of any conclusions which may be attained by their use may be regarded as my main object i have however also attempted in chapter six to present some conclusions with regard to the proper answer to the question what is good in itself which are very different from any which have commonly been advocated by philosophers i have tried to define the classes within which all great goods and evils fall and i have maintained that very many different things are good and evil in themselves and that neither class of things possesses any other proper which is both common to all its members and peculiar to them in order to express the fact that the ethical propositions of my first class are incapable of proof or disproof, I have sometimes followed Sidgwick's usage in calling them intuitions. But I beg that it may be noticed that I am not an intuitionist, in the ordinary sense of the term. Sidgwick himself seems never to have been clearly aware of the immense importance of the difference which distinguishes his intuitionism from the common doctrine which has generally been called by that name. The intuitionist proper is distinguished by maintaining that propositions of my second class, propositions which assert that a certain action is right or a duty, are incapable of proof or disproof by any inquiry into the results of such actions. I, on the contrary, am no less anxious to maintain that propositions of this kind are not intuitions than to maintain that propositions of my first class are intuitions again i would wish it observed that when i call such propositions intuitions i mean merely to assert that they are incapable of proof i imply nothing whatever as to the manner or origin of our cognition of them still less do i imply as most intuitionists have done that any propositions whatever is true because we cognize it in a particular way or by the exercise of any particular faculty i hold on the contrary that in every way in which it is possible to cognize a true proposition it is also possible to cognize a false one when this book had been already completed i found in brentano's origin of the knowledge of right and wrong opinions far more closely resembling my own than those of any other ethical writer with whom i am acquainted brentano appears to agree with me completely one in regarding all ethical propositions as defined by the fact that they predicate a single unique objective concept two in dividing such propositions sharply into the same two kinds three in holding that the first kind are incapable of proof and four with regard to the kind of evidence which is necessary and relevant to the proof of the second kind but he regards the fundamental ethical concept as being not the simple one which i denote by good but the complex one which i have taken to define beautiful and he does not recognize but even denies by implication the principle which i have called the principle of organic unities in consequence of these two differences his conclusions as to what things are good in themselves also differ very materially from mine he agrees however that there are many different goods and that the love of good and beautiful objects constitutes an important clause among them i wish to refer to one oversight of which i became aware only when it was too late to correct it and which may i am afraid cause unnecessary trouble to some readers i have omitted to discuss directly the mutual relations of the several different notions which are all expressed by the word end the consequences of this omission may be partially avoided by reference to my article on teleology in baldwin's dictionary of philosophy and psychology if i were to rewrite my work now i should make a very different and i believe that i could make a much better book but it may be doubted whether in attempting to satisfy myself i might not merely render more obscure the ideas which i am most anxious to convey without a corresponding gain in completeness and accuracy however that may be my belief that to publish the book as it stands was probably the best thing i could do does not prevent me from being painfully aware that it is full of defects End of preface.